Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll be the, the last one before lunch, so I will try to be brief. Um, so uh, what I'm going to show you today uh, is, the, um, is a study ab ab uh, about the ions around the proteins, actually. Um, so it's not so much about the protein itself. So in a sense, this is not protein electrostatics as the name of the meeting, but about the ions around the protein. So electrostatics is involved as well. So this was actually um, a result in a sense of, of the webinars that, that uh, Walter organized in, in 2021, because this was, our, this 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 project I'm going to show you the results um, was basically prompted by two talks on the on those webinars, one by 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 Tom Lau, um, where he kept in we will hear him uh, tomorrow anyway. So um, he was insisting on the need to look at at the ions at the bound ions whether they were being encountered or not, um, and and. And another thing is that I realized that for, for um, people that do simulations and for some experimentalists dealing with some kinds of methods, what you mean by protein charge is a slightly different thing, but I will come back to that um, in a moment. Um, and the other talk that I found very interesting at the time was, was by, by Junji Iwawara. So um, in that case, in that case what he showed us was about the the, the NMR-based studies of the ions actually around the, the protein. And I found that quite interesting, particularly the, the measure of the so-called ion excess. Um, and I thought, well, maybe we could try to look at this from, from our simulations. And he also had some comparisons of the experimental data with, with Poisson Boltzmann. Um, so what I'm going to show you is basically an analysis of a previous simulation, now looking at the ions and, and trying to, to, to understand what, what we can learn from that. Um, so when the work is, is have been published in, in that paper. So um, let's start with this. So uh, we basically took um, a constant PHMD simulation that we have done previously of this small protein. It's a soluble protein, beta lactoglobulin or BLG. Uh, it's an abundant protein that it has been widely studied and uh, it's a small one and buys hydrophobic ligands in the pocket and so on. But that's not that relevant in this, in this context. So this, I'm, I'm just using this as a, as, a, as a test system in a sense to study the ions. Um, the relevant aspects in this case is the it, has a, uh, it can form dimers. So we, we have simulations of the monomer and the dimer. And then there are other interesting um, aspects that we will hear about uh, tomorrow by my student, Lucy, the, Lucy Rocha. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things that I realized, I, I must confess that I never paid too much attention to the to ions around proteins. Um, and then I realized that most of the studies that are done of ions around biomolecules are actually done with nucleic acids, which makes sense, right? Because they are very highly, uh, with very high charge density and ions are crucial in that, in that case. But then I realized that in the case of proteins, there are not, not that many experimental studies, detailed experimental studies of, of ions. Um, so not, neither experimental nor computation, as I, as I said, so, <clears throat> so we decided to, to look at this. Um, the simulation details, I mean, the, the things relevant here, we studied both the monomer and the dimer in a pH range using constant pHMD. I will look at more detail to that in a moment. Um, from, from three to eight pH. Um, and, and one aspect which is relevant here that I never thought very much, I mean, not in a very careful way about it before, is how, how you add the, the ions to the, to, the, to the simulation box, uh, how you put anions and cations. And what I have used until now 
uh, when I include ions in simulations is that I assume that um, we want to keep the, the box neutral and we want to keep the same ionic strength. Uh, I will explain this in, in better uh, afterwards. But the, this is, a, is an important par part in this, in this uh, study. And then we had several titrating sites um, of different types. We, uh, we, we actually have a free C stadium. Um, but in, in, in fact, we didn't, um, we didn't include as titrable. And uh, Jana may argue with me and say that, well, you should have put, put it as titrable. Maybe we should have. Um, I think we were lucky because the C stadium kept um, perfectly still in a hydrophobic region internalized the whole time. So I guess you were, we were lucky in this in that respect. Anyway, so in terms of, in terms of methods, the simulations were done with constant PHMD. I, will, I, I don't really have to repeat this. You already have heard um, Miguel yesterday explaining the method in some detail and then some of his students as well. And, and today, Jana did a, a really nice overview of the different methods. So basically what this method does is it, it, it tries to, to, to use the complementarity of the, on the one hand you have MMMD, which is quite good to sample and confirmations, um, but not protonation states, of course, which are fixed. And on the other hand, you have Poisson, Boltzmann and Monte Carlo, which can do the other thing, can, can, can sample protonation states quite nicely in principle. Or, and uh, but not confirmation. So the way to do this was to try to combine them in a sound way, um, and and that's what we used. We used the so-called stochastic titration method that was already explained to you before. So basically, you are doing a <clears throat> uh, an MMM M, uh, sorry an MMMD simulation, and from time to time you stop. You do a Poisson Boltzmann and a Monte Carlo. You get a new set of proton of proton states. Um, of protonation states, and then you you replace the you replace the protons the proton states in the in the protein. You relax the solvent a bit, and then you keep going on. From time to time, you stop and do this. So in this way, you get you get uh, you get to sample conformations and protonation states. Uh, so in a cyclical way, as shown here. Um, I will not not go in the, in in this into this. This is just to say that you can show that these samples from the proper ensemble and so on and so forth, et cetera. Um, um, anyway, besides constant pH, we did we decided to do also a comparison with, with Poisson Boltzmann. Actually, as Junji has done with, with his experimental data, just to compare and see how, how it fares. And in this, in this case, since we are using a protein. Um, we decided to, to, to test linear Poisson Boltzmann as well because since the since the charge density is so much lower in principle uh, and to see how it goes okay if he, if it's acceptable or not for the ions to use linear, uh, the linear form so we did these 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 comparisons there, there in the case of nucleic acids as I said before there are a lot of studies and different comparisons with, with these methods and also with inter integral equation theory methods. Like three D rays and so on, um, so these these comparisons are, are are these things are quite well understood in the case of nucleic acids actually. Um, so in the case of the properties from the MD simulations is basically just counting ions, so it's it's a trivial thing. You, you you analyze frame by frame and count the ions, but in one of the things I will show you, you use the an ion concentration grid. Um, computed um, using a kernel density estimation. In the case of the, of the properties of from the Poisson Boltzmann calculations, it's always concentration grade based, okay? Always based on a, on a grid of concentrations, and the concentrations were used using the usual expression that you use when you derive the Poisson Boltzmann equation. So the concentrations are are are, uh, are proportional to the, to the you scale the concent the bulk concentration with the exponential of the in what should be the potential of mean force of the ion, and as usual in this case, it's replaced by the by the electrostatic um, energy of of the ion. So, <clears throat> looking first at the um, at the bound ions, and this is related with with Tom Lauer's um, uh, uh, studies. Uh, what is a bound ion? Well, traditionally, where well, uh, or at least one of the possible 
uh, classifications, which is due to manning. Um, it's, you, can, you can talk about site-bound ions, which have a clearly defined position in the structure. You can, all, you can often see them in the, in the crystallographic structures. Um, and, and then you can, you can have what you, I mean, what you can call territorially bound ions, which are the ions that are loosely bound to the surface but they show up in a lot of experiments because they are kind of dragged along with the protein in a lot of cases. So you see them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, since in this protein, in this case, in, in, in BLG, uh, there are really no site bound ions. When I talk about, when I say bound, right, from, from this point on, I mean territorially bound, okay? Um, so we started by looking at, uh, at uh, short some of the short di distance features to try to come out with a criterion to decide what is bound and what it's not bound um well maybe the the the, the legend the the letters in the figures are too small but um we looked at uh, the top row is the, is the total charge the total cumulative charge as you increase the idea is you come from the protein surface and you start going further and further away and see what amount of charge or number of ions you have accumulated so far at different cutoff values. And um, at short distance, up, these, these plots show up to a cutoff of five, uh, of five angstroms only, um, which is in the X axis. Uh, what you have, um, in general, what we observed for the, for the total charge, for the total cumulative charge. And in the, here I, I said that cumulative charge was sodium plus chloride, but actually it's plus the protein as well. So it's, it's, the, it's the cumulative charge of this entity, protein plus, plus ions. Um, actually the results from MM and uh, from MD and, uh, and the non-linear Poisson Boltzmann are quite similar. Uh, the linear form has some strange features because if you look at the, at the upper right um, upper right plot, you see that the pH order is, uh, is not even um, kept. The relation between the curves are not, are not even kept. And there are some strange, really strange outliers. Uh, in that case, you have a pH 8 that for some strange reason, reason uh, the curve just goes up uh, in a strange way. Um, when you look at the amount of, of sodium ions, which is the middle row, uh, when you look at that, you see again that, well, the MD is similar to the nonlinear. The LPB is, a, again, um, it's a much wider range. Uh, if you could see, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't think you can see the labels, but the scale in the Y axis is, is much uh, is, is, is higher in the case of the linear form, because the, the, otherwise the, the that the curve for pH eight would not would not fit there, um, and for chlorides, um, you have a similar situation. In, the, in this case, the the linear form is not so weird, okay. Um, but overall, what we get here from this picture, and this is for the monomer, for the monomeric form only, uh, the picture, what we get here from this picture is that okay, ions approach um, closer in the case of the MD simulations. Which is the which is the left the left uh, the left row? If you compare the left with the middle, which is nonlinear Poisson Boltzmann, you can see, for example, in this. Um, I will not touch this because this seems to be become weird. If you look at these two plots, MD and non nonlinear PB, you can see that that the ions approach closer in the case of the MD. You start accumulating the number of ions. Much is much earlier than than in the in the PB case, which is interesting. Um, and again, you have, you have this this problem with the, with the nonlinear form. If you look at the dimer, the situation is very similar. I will not go into much detail. Um, but you, what you see again is that in 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 general, the MD and the nonlinear are quite similar. Always the, the ions always approach closer. Uh, in the in the MD case, and the nonlinear is also is always very strange. Okay, so this seems to indicate there is a really a pro some kind of problem with the, with the linear form, even for for a system with a much much lower charge density than a nucleic acid. Uh, 
if you reorganize this, this data using a, a, a titration curve, um, what you see is that the, <clears throat> you have there the, the titration curve for the, for the protein without ions, which is the, the one which goes here, for example, and here, okay, is the most abrupt one. And the interesting thing is that when you start to consider the, uh, the, the, these loosely bound ions around at, at different cutoffs, as you, as you increase more and more, when you enlarge the cutoff and when you go to the red curve at five angstroms, um, you are attenuating the charge. The, the, the charge, the, when, the, when the protein is positive at low pH, it, 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 it becomes, the whole entity becomes less positive and, and when it is negative at high pH, it becomes less negative. This, this is not that surprising, okay? But uh, it's more or less what, what we would expect. Um, but in this case, so you see, we see this both for the monomer and the dimer, the MD and the nonlinear are quite similar. Um, and again, in the case of the, of the linear form, you can clearly see that something is very strange because you lose, you completely lose the, the continuity that, that we would expect when you move along pH, okay? So <clears throat> the reason for this discrepancy with, with the linear form, if we think about it, is not that surprising really. Um, because as you know, when you derive the linear form for the poisson boston equation, you actually throw away um, most of the, I mean, you just keep the first two terms of the exponential um, to get a linear form that you can, can use in the end. Um, but as I told you at the beginning, what you are doing here, what we, we have done, the way you have done it, is that you, we compute the, the, the concentration grid in space using that expression, which uses the full exponential. So this is probably the source of the problem. We, we could try to be smart and say, well, but then let's try to use some kind of linear of, of, of version of the concentrations, which is, which is uh, consistent with the linear form. So using the first two terms of the exponential, but that's completely nonsense because in some cases you will get negative, negative concentrations. So this is clearly, uh, it, would, it, it would clearly be a, a nonsense solution. So, um, so the conclusion here is the, as I, as I told you, we decided to include the linear form as well, just to see if in this case with less charge density than in nucleic acids, it would be uh, uh, useful to use the, the linear form, it isn't. So we, sh we should avoid it for, for, for estimate, to estimate ion concentrations around, it seems terrible, okay? Um, uh, for, for the actual interior of the protein, this, uh, it will be a completely different thing. But here is, doesn't seem to be a good, a really good idea. So, okay, but we still need uh, some kind of criterion for, for, uh, to decide what is a bound ion. When, what we thought about was, okay, if something really, um, if you can say that some ions are actually bound in some sense, even if, if they are loosely bound, um, they should probably contribute to the first sharp peaks of the radial distribution function, right? Uh, at least to the first one or two peaks, the ones that are sharper, they should contribute because otherwise they, it's hard to, it's not convincing to say that they are, that they are loosely bounded. Um, so we thought about using the, the, the RDFs to decide that. The problem is as some of you have, may, have probably experienced, um, the, the, the usual normalization of radial distribution functions from leaky theory, I mean, assumes, assumes a, a, a radial, a, a symmetric system. And I mean, this is horrible. This is terrible. You, you don't see the peaks, you don't see anything because you are assuming shells, concentric spherical shell, cells, shells. So this is really awful. Uh, our, first, um, our first educated guess, let's call it this way, was, well, maybe a cutoff around four or five angstroms because there are some short peaks and then some, a shoulder after five angstroms, angstroms, there don't seem to be any shoulders. So this was really guesswork. 
and some of you might remember from, from the webinar in, 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 uh, in 21, um, when, I, when I gave the, the talk with the, with the results for the PLG, for the actual protein, um, when I showed the results, since Tom has been uh, insisting on this problem, we decided to, to, to try to make a quick and dirty kind of estimate of this kind. Uh, and the, 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 the estimate was done with these with this lousy um, RDFs. But I mean, to do this in a proper way, we should come with, with, a, with a better way. And what we, we decided to do is to define a, 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 an RDF in a completely different way to avoid this normalization, this incredibly frustrating normalization approach. So we decided we decided to define the radial distribution functions in terms of molalities, okay? And the way it works is this way. So you, you define the, the, the RDF as the molality of, of the ion at a given distance from the protein um, <clears throat> relative to the, to the molality that the ion would have in, in the bulk, okay? And when I say the distance from the protein, I really mean the distance to the nearest atom of the protein. When I talk about distance to the, from the protein, Thing is always the closest dis dis uh, distance, okay? So where we do that, the way you, you can, so the, we define the RDF in that way. And then the way we compute the molality um, is, 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 is actually extremely simple. You just use the histograms that you count during the MD that you usually use to, to, comp to compute the, the usual, the traditional, the density-based um, RDF. So you just count how many, how many, how many <clears throat> hits you have in, in one histogram at one distance. And in this case, you divide by the histogram of the water times the molar mass. So you, you directly compute a molality at, at each distance. And when I say at each distance, it's, it's in all places where you are at that distance from the surface of the protein, okay? Uh, if you do that, you don't need any kind of normalization. You take everything from, from the histograms and then you get this beautiful thing with peaks. Um, so the peaks become much, much, much clearer. Now, now they are, now you can call them peaks, not before. Um, and what you, what you see here, and, and they converge to, to one, as you would expect at long distances and so on. So, and what you see here, Okay, now we can we can decide. Let's include um, one or two peaks, maybe one, maybe two. The, the second peak is not uh, that sharp. Then it, it has a shoulder, so it's arguable whether you should include one peak or two peaks. So we decided to to use the interval of flows. So if we use a cutoff from, if you go up to three point five or or five angstroms, you get the total charge for BLG monomer. In the case of pH three, because that's when you, for which we have uh, experimental data, um, if you if you look at pH three and, and uh, zero point one molar of ionic strings, then we get between twelve and thirteen point six, which is in excellent agreement with the, with the, with the value that that Tom Lau uh, inferred from from um, membrane confined electrophoresis with uh, with uh, the Bayeux Henry correction, which is thirteen point seven plus or minus one point five. So. The agreement is, is actually quite good if you use this criterion of the, of the first one or two peaks, okay? Um, so you can actually use MD or constant PHMD. In this case, it was constant PHMD because the simulations we had were using constant PHMD. So apparently you can use MD to get a really nice estimate of the, of the, of the, of the territorially bound ions that you see in some kinds of experiments. So it seems to be quite good, the, the prediction. Um, second thing, we decided to look at the, um, at the ion distribution. Um, what you have here in this slide, at the ion distribution in space, okay, in the grid of concentrations, what he, you have here is, is um, I'm not, I don't know if you are familiar with box plots. They are a, a quite nice way to visualize the all features of, of the distribution. Um, so on the x axis you have you have pH, um, and then the box the box plots represent the following. You have a box which represents the interquartile range. Then you have a line index box which represents the median. 
and then you have a line um, that that uh, in this case represents 99 percent of the of the whole range of the, all the values of the concentration uh, and then you have outliers shown as points okay this is what is usually called bo a box plot and for this kind of global comparisons can be quite useful i'm sorry that the pictures are, are actually a bit small um so um the conclusion so we have and here we have um even i have problem reading it sorry um so the the two left ones this this is the the md monomer this is the sorry this is the md monomer and this is the, the nonlinear pp monomer and this is here is the same for the dimer okay um and what you see here uh the md and nonlinear are actually quite similar um um with some exceptions um the the ph dependency oh sorry and the, in the x-axis you have the, the the ph varying from three to eight okay in each of the plots so what you see is what you would generally expect in terms of the ph dependency so you get the distributions get shifted uh in the case of sodiums to higher values as ph increases and in the case of chlorides to lower values as ph increases as you would expect is expect from electrostatic um <clears throat> from, from electrostatic point of view and the shift is of of the of the old distribution in a sense of the median of the interquartile range they, they all get shifted and also of the maximum value um low concentrations are always present so you can see that you always come to the to the bottom um the, the concentrations are on the on the y-axis um one thing that is um that you can see is that in the case of the of the poisson boltzmann model um sometimes when you look at the outliers and for example if you look here you would see that this part is logarithmic the scale okay this part is not logarithmic this is logarithmic after 0 0.2 and i recall you that this is at 0 0.1 um ionic strength okay so it's this guy here this this position here this is 0 0.2 um and what you can see is that the counter ions, for example, in this case at pH three, uh, and this is, is this is chloride, the, the outliers can go up to stratospheric concentrations. Okay, in that case, you can go up to 100, um, 100, um, uh, 100 molar. Um, of course, this is just one point, right? One voxel in the grid, but sometimes this happens. Okay, sometimes you get a huge over over condensation of ions of counter ions in, in at some places. Um, anyway, where if you look also at at the distributions in, in a more special way, what you see is if you do a um, isopotential contours, um, what you see. Well, this is not potential actually. Is iso concentration contours. Um, what you see is that if you do contours of the concentrations at at uh, 200 millimolar, um, actually the MD and the nonlinear PB are quite similar. Okay, um, and and um, so uh, the overall they are they are quite similar overall although there are some differences of course and one of them which is more or less expected is that i mean the 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 the, the poisson boltzmann is of obviously done with a single structure so it's it's the results are the, i mean you are stuck with that with that with that structure and in the case of the of the md where the grid of concentrations were, was built uh, taking all the snapshots i mean in, in a sense the side chains of the, of the protein they kind of wipe off the ions on average. So it's interesting because the, uh, the, the, one of the effects of these uh, is that the, 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 the nonlinear contours, which are the solid ones, <clears throat> usually uh, go closer to the protein than the MD ones. So, which is, if you think about it, it's not that surprising because of, the, of this uh, uh, wiping effect of the of this of the motion of the of the side chains mostly okay um so the the message here in this case is okay the overall 
concentration distribution seems to be similar in both cases, but when you start looking at the details, it's not that similar at all. And this is observed for all pH values, that one also for pH 5, which is near the isoelectric point. And in this case, you can see, if you, if you look in more detail at each of the cases, you will see the same pattern, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, uh, we come to the, to the final part, which is the comparing the whole, the whole um, box or the whole grid in the case of the PB and, uh, and uh, in terms both of total charge and, uh, and, uh, and the ion excess. And in this case, I will probably start by, by talking a bit about the, the, the way we usually add ions to, to, to MD simulations, to the, box, to the box of MD simulations. Uh, I think that the most traditional, I, I will put traditional there, there just for the lack of a better word, um, to, this, to, this, uh, to describe this, this protocol, which I think is one of the most used ones that I've seen being used. It's basically a two-step procedure. You first add counter ions to neutralize, okay? To neutralize the charge of, of your protein. Uh, and then on top of that, you add an amount of ions, both counter ions and co-ions, that you would that you would usually have in the bulk solution from the region of the same size. Okay, um, so the protocol has these two steps. Uh, the result of this is that, I mean, for the counter ions, you would get so the number of counter ions will be equal to the absolute value of the of the of the charge of the protein plus the ones in in solution. Okay, that would exist if if this was a bulk solution. And for the co-ions, it's just the second term, right? So it's just the amount of, of, of co-ions that would exist in a, in, a, in a bulk environment. So if you take this, you can compute the ion excess, uh, which is, I mean, it's actually quite simple quantity from a, from a conceptual point of view. It's just the difference between the ions that you actually have in a given region subtracted from the ions that you would have uh, if you were in the, in the bulk in a the, in the region with the same size. Um, so what this gives, if you use this protocol, this protocol, which is the most usual one, I think, um, what you would get is that for the counter ions, you would get that the ion excess would be equal to the charge of the protein, to the absolute value of the charge of the protein, and would be zero for the co-ions, okay? Now, this is in a complete disagreement with Junji's values, because what they found from the NMI experiments in, in, in ion quantification uh, um, of, of the anions in this case, which were uh, acetate, acetates, if, I, if I'm not wrong, yes, yeah. It was, it was with acetate, it was the only anion in solution. Um, and what they see is that it's roughly half of the charge, actually. So it's not really, uh, the, 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 the <clears throat> sorry, uh, the ion excess is, is just a, is a value which is about half of the charge. So you see there, you have, uh, Used, you used three proteins. Um, the first is antenopedia, which has a charge of plus 12, then BPTE, uh, plus six in, in the conditions used in the experiment. And then the last one is as charged here is ubiquitin. Um, and as you can see, I mean, for the 12, you have around six. For the, for the six, for the charge six, you have around, it's a bit more than three, right? It's more closer to, to four. Um, so it's definitely not, so this protocol for, for adding ions to the, to the simulations is definitely giving the wrong, completely wrong uh, uh, ion excess values. I mean, at least uh, looking when you look at the experimental values. So there's something wrong with this protocol. The protocol that we used, that I have used before, I mean, just because it seems to make sense, but I, I, I must confess that I never give too much importance to this. Um, because to me it sounds, it seems more or, more or less sensible that, to say that, okay, I want a neutral system, sure, okay. Uh, I want that the, the, the charge of the protein plus the charge, the number of, cat, of cations and an ion, sorry, there's a mistake there. I should have minus N uh, minus, okay, Mi minus the, cat the cations, the anions, sorry, the number of anions. I'm assuming uh, one, one salt, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, so to have, a, to have a neutral system and also to have an ionic strength equal to the one in the bulk, right? This seems sensible more or less to me. So if you do this, uh, 
what you get is that you actually have two conditions. You have this one over there for the neutral charge, and then you have this one, okay, um, that you, that you should be satisfied. If you solve those two equations, you would find that um, that the number of ions the of cat of uh, cations would be given by this, okay. The number in the bulk that would exist in the bulk minus the charge of the protein, uh, half of the charge of the protein. Uh, and in the, in the case of anions, you would get the numbers that would, you would get in the bulk plus the, the half of the charge of the protein, okay? And if you compute the ion excess, lo and behold, I was not expecting this, we get the values that Junji measured, more or less, okay? We get half of the, of the charge of the protein. So in the case of the, of, of the, of the, of the experiment with, with, with the acetate ions, um, you, we would get uh, six, three, not four, three. So it's not exactly the same. It's one, one, one unit distant, different uh, and zero. So this is in quite nice agreement with, with the results of, or with the experiment, the experimental um, results with, from the NMR-based uh, quantification. Uh, which is quite nice. I mean, um, so we decided to go and have a look at at the results in more detail, because one 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 thing I I, I could not, um, but but I, I will come to that in a, in a moment. Um, so when you compare in this case, when we compare the 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 the, the MD data, which is on the left. Uh, with the Poisson-Boltzmann data that is on the right, we have to keep in mind two things. The first one is that this is constant pHMD, and the way we do it, uh, contrary, for, for, for instance, in contrast to what the way Yana does, um, we don't, we have approximate neutralization, okay? The, the charge is not strictly, the sorry, not, uh, yeah. The charge of the system is not strictly zero, is around zero, more or less, okay? Because we, we don't have uh, this kind of, um, or should I call it, yeah, this kind of buffer with the ions, right, that you can compensate. Um, uh, so we have to have in mind that aspect and another aspect, which is really a, a practical problem, which is when you map the, when you map the, the ion positions in the, in, the, in the simulation box with periodic boundary conditions, which a weird shape, right, in this case, um, a rhombic dot case, I think. When you try to, to map it, in a cubic grid, then we have problems. And to, without, with a cubic grid, without periodic boundary conditions. So to be safe, we shouldn't go beyond a given cutoff, okay? Which in the case of the monomer, it's only uh, 15 angstroms, okay? So after 15 angstroms here in the MD plot, you don't have more than, you don't have any data here. And then you, you have that in the end, okay? At the, at the end of the box, when you reach the full box, you would have half the charge of the protein, the, 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 the rule that I just show you, okay? And in the case of the, of the Poisson-Boltzmann, you have all the, all, the, all the distances, of course, you just have to go from the, from the, in, the, in, the, in the concentration grid that you computed with the Poisson-Boltzmann, and you just count and see how, how much charge and how much ions you have accumulated and so on. Well, now, when you do this, what you see, in terms of the total charge, so the protein plus the ions, if when you start to increase the cutoff, the distance from the protein, what you see is that both the both the, the MD and PB um, uh, they converge to zero more or less rap quickly. I mean, around uh, twenty, yeah, twenty, well, twenty-five more. You are already quite close to to, the, to zero charge. Of course, when you reach the end of the box, you should be at, at zero charge, okay? Or in the case of the MD, close to that. Uh, um, and what you see is that in the case of, of the ion excess, which which are in the, so the, in the top is you have the total charge and here we have the ion excess for the cations and here for the anions, okay? And when you look at it, uh, this the the shape of the curves are more or less similar between MD and and PB, um, but clearly the PB converges faster, okay, um, to the to the values. Uh, it will be even more that that aspect will be even more much more clear in the in the dimer, which is a bigger protein. 
Um, but the, the interesting thing is that they converge to, to different asymptotic values. Okay, how much time do I have? Okay. Um, so they are converging to different values. If you look at, if you look at these, these endpoints here, in the MD, they are always lower than in the, in the PD case, okay? So, uh, and the, the, the distance is, is higher, the higher is the charge of the proton in magnitude. So in the dimer, you get exactly the same thing. Uh, the, 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 the asymptotic values are always higher in the PD case. Um, so if you look, well, in this, sorry, in this, in this case, yeah. In this case, the safe distance is longer, but you still have to throw away some part of the data. Actually, if you want, if you feel uncomfortable with, well, I would like to not be, I would like to have the data also for that distance. You can, you can avoid the problem using again, a molality based calculation, okay? If you do that, you can, you can compute the, 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 the concentration, the numbers of ions you would have in terms of molalities instead, instead of, of molarities, okay? And then in that case, you can get the full curves, okay? They are very similar to the, to the ones shown in the, in the previous plots, okay? They converge to the same values and so on. Now, <clears throat> if, you, if you plot together against the, the protein charge, if you plot together all the values that, that we obtain uh, with both with MD and with the PB, values of for the ion excess well the, the solid lines are for the md because it they follow this half charge rule okay so they are the the, the the solid lines blue for the cation and the orange for the for the anion um and the, and the, the results we got for the for the poisson boltzmann model uh are the circles and and the and the, the dashed lines are just to guide your your view okay um and what you see is that the, 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 the empty circles are actually above the lines, always above the lines. And as you go to higher, to, to more positive and more negative charge of the protein, they become further and further away from the curves. So, uh, and in fact, if you look at Junji's that data, it's interesting. I mean, it's difficult to say because it's still very, very, it would be nice to have uh, uh, proteins with, with higher charges in, in your data. That would be really nice. Because what you see is that at, for the protein with, with plus 12, uh, actually, in fact, the, the nonlinear Poisson-Boltzmann calculation that he did actually is a bit higher and it's close to, to, our, to our curve. So this is quite interesting because not only we see these, but it seems that even the, the, the NMR-based quantification seems to be showing more or less the same trend, okay? So, um, of course you can say, well, but maybe this is all very nice, but your, your simulation box are probably too small, way too small. They are always too small, right? The, the, the simulation boxes, we all know that. They should be much larger. Uh, but still, if you imagine that you could have larger boxes. Um, think about it. The, the first protocol that I told you about, which I think is the most used one from, it's my impression. Uh, the, even if you go to more realistic boxes to large boxes, uh, you would always get the wrong um, ion excess, always, because it's fixed by the protocol. So it, the, 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 the counter ion, uh, ion excess would be always equal to the charge of the, of the of the protein, always, not half of it, more or less, always equal to that. So it's always wrong, the other protocol. Here we can say, okay, in this case, um, the in this case, you would have, if you, were, you, you have the luxury to do a really big box, then this problem should probably disappear and you would follow this half, half charge rule uh, 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 as well, now with with a more uh, more uh, should I put this? You are, your your ions are not shrunk within the box. There there are there are studies of this for nucleic acids actually, um, 
which is quite interesting because in some cases to be absolutely convert to have absolutely converged to the right concentration in solution you'd have to have these huge 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 boxes okay that i mean it, the, the, so the boxes are always too small that's true but now you, you can you can say me well you can tell me well maybe this this half charge rule why, why should we follow this half charge rule um and then i have i have one question i have one question to 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 junji which is that, that i don't really understand what what is the volume that you are accounting for your, in your experiments how far to the from the protein would that correspond to you see my my point um because if i think about it for instance if we think if we are thinking about a, a, a dilute protein solution we can approximately think of it as a bunch of cells with the as as we can we can think about this, the actual solution as consisting of a bunch of cells contiguous cells with the size that if, if we want to think about them as, spher as spherical the, the radius of, of of this sphere would be half of the of the average distance from to the other protein okay so the, the solution can could be seen as a collection of these things so by definition since the whole thing must be neutral each of these cells must be neutral so the first condition should be valid to keep things neutral right in my, in my protocol that's what i assume oh sorry so first condition have a neutral system now if the actual solution is neutral by necessity right uh, so then each of the cells that compose it must be neutral so the first condition must be met and but the second one must be met as well because if your solution can be regarded approximately as this as this set of big cells each enclosing one 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 protein actually there is a variant for uh, Quasim Boltzmann models that uses this. I don't remember the name. It's the cell model or something like that. Um, where you go as far as half to the distance to the next to the next uh, protein. Um, and the second condition must also apply because if if the ionic strength of the whole solution is indeed the ionic strength that, that you prepare with it, then each of the if and if the cells are are more are essentially equivalent and similar then each of each of of the cells should have the same ionic strength as the bulk by definition so since this, from these two conditions it follows these two relations the half charge rule follows from those two conditions directly so my impression is that if you go this far you must really have this this condition so but I, but I don't know what the experiments are actually measuring. Maybe in the, in the after after I finish, maybe I would like to to to, to know what 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 you say. Um, so sorry, I think I did something. No, so uh, yeah, because I was here. Yeah, I was here. So um, conclusions so what conclusions can we take from this the first the first thing is what i told you before uh, about what what does the protein charge mean i think there's a we are talking past past each other in some cases because for most people doing simulations the, the charge of the protein is just the charge of the of the ionizable groups i mean the titrable groups and if you have some some site bound ion that is really there and so on that's the charge of the protein for us but if you talk with someone who does actual experiments that that feel all those guys being dragged along in the in the in the in the experiment like tom sees when he, when he does when he does the, the the electrophoretic experiments then for him obviously the prote protein charge would mean the charge of this entity that my experiment is capturing right uh, so when we talk about protein charging we are talking about different things i think and part of the confusion comes from that because what we see here is that from if you include ions in your simulation then you should be perfectly be able to 
to compute the, to estimate the territorial bound ions. I mean, um, so we can actually predict theoretically, uh, sorry, territorially bound ions. So the second thing, and this is more a practical advice, uh, when I when I come up with this with this molality based RDF, I really like it. I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm really going to use this for for everything, because that that normalization thing in, with with RDF with the traditional RDF in proteins is a nightmare. Um, there, there were there were times in some projects that uh, we were planning to use the RDFs to infer some things about this and, and we gave up because of this. So my advice is use this kind of thing. It's very easy to, to compute actually from the histograms. So uh, about the linear form of the boston boltzmann equation, well, for ion concentrations, my advice is don't use it because for for compute, to compute electrostatic potentials in proteins, which are not highly highly charged density systems and so on, it should work fine. I use it for, for the Poisson Boltzmann part in my in my constant pH and simulations. I use it because I mean I couldn't I couldn't afford using the nonlinear form because then I would have to make one calculation every time I do one move and that's completely impossible to do. So I need to have a, a pairwise decomposable um, energy. Okay. So I need the linear form. But not for this. I don't think it's a it's a good idea. I mean, I think it's a terrible idea, actually. Um, so the MD and the nonlinear form gave very similar very similar results most of, in most of the quantities that we computed. Um, of course, there are some some differences at the surface, which are to be expected. Um, but the most thing that comes off is is this asymptotic value for for the for the ion excess values. Uh, which for some reason that I don't understand, the, it's always overestimated. They are they have always higher values than than the, the half charge rule, and I don't understand why. I couldn't understand why why that that would be. Um, so, and not all ion addition protocols um, are made equal. So, the, I, I suggest to people to avoid this more traditional whatever. Um, protocol where you first do the counter ion neutralization then and, and, and ions and I think you should probably use some uh, an approach like this okay where you impose um, where you impose the half charge rule of course of course it, you can never it's not it's it's always a bit off because when you solve the two equations you get half ions one quarter of ions and so on so you have to round things of course but this is probably a good idea to do to 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 do to use in MD simulations to try to impose these these two conditions and actually when I was doing this this I, I was thinking about your Yana about your your protocol because I don't remember so well the details miss but I don't know maybe this could be useful for you because in your case the ions are, is, are really important right for the actual method for the actual constant pH so okay so the people have that have done. Lucy, who is here, and we will hear tomorrow talking about the protein itself. Um, Lucy did, mo did all these simulations, all, all the stuff. Um, and then me and, and Sarah, the camp that we, 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 we helped with, with, the, with the analysis. Actually, the idea of, the, of, the, of, the whole pro of this whole study was from Sarah, actually. She's, she's no longer at my lab, but. Um, She's sorely missed. Um, and, and I mean, and I also the, 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 I have also to acknowledge Tom because I mean, um, it, it was, it, it was funny because I, I was working with the protein with he has studied, he had not published and he had the values exactly that I could compare with my, with my, with my simulations. So uh, thank you, Tom, as well. Um, and, and the, 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 the Portuguese funding um, agency for the for the funds, and thank you so much. A quick question: uh, the fantastic talk, very interesting. Uh, thank you. So I'm surprised you didn't bring up the idea of a debilings, debilings. 
uh, to figure out how far away the excess ions should trail off from the protein? Why? Yeah. You mean the, the, the how, closer, how close the, the ions approach the, the, oh, the long range, okay. In, in the MD case or in the Poisson Boltzmann case? In theory. Well, if you just ch t t take the protein as a charge in the center and figure out when you expect the atmosphere to level off. Yeah. Um, actually, it depends, yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, you can use the Dubai length, for instance, if you, if you think in terms of traditional bioequal theory, right, where you can have the, you have the, you have the, um, if you, if you, if you plot a graph of the, of the distance. Yeah, it, it would be just interesting to see the comparison right. if it trails of the, the distance. Peak, the, the, the peak, the peak of the distribution will be the, 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 the Dubai length, right? The peak of, in the traditional Dubai Euclid model, the peak you have of the distribution is the, is the value of the Dubai length, but you still have a lot of, uh, of, of ions after that. I always thought Dubai length will give you basically when the concentration goes to bulk. How far? But because in the, I mean, it depends on how, which kind of model you are thinking about. But in the, in the, in the traditional the Euclid model, primitive model, it only go to zero in, in, at infinity. Uh, it starts to go down at the value of yeah. the Dubai length. Right. Yeah, you, you could, it's, that, that would be interesting to, to try to, let's say, see That's when the. To see where it's actually like so, how compare and see how, how bad the bulk Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 could, I could see that, yeah. To see how, how, in that kind of calculation, using just the, the ionic strength, right? To see how far I should go. I, actually, I think that uh, Tom Laws, I, I think his experiments, I think he does something like that. I don't remember the details when he does this Dubai Euclid Henry correction, okay? Because he has to, uh, you, he has to use a model also to interpret the data in a sense. And I think he does that. Maybe he does that, he, he knows that better than I do. Okay, I, 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 but that, that's an interesting suggestion. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Hi. So I, I, I need Junji to ask, <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, ask, uh, uh, not ask, answer uh, your yes. question. Yes, thank uh, you. So um, <clears throat> you mentioned about um, basically possibility of uh, protein, protein, I mean, impact of protein, protein uh, distance, right? And uh, um, probably as you remember, um, the way we uh, determined the ion axis was uh, to measure uh, anion uh, concentration at some different protein concentrations. Yes. And the protein concentration range was <clears throat> between 0 0.15 millimolar uh, and uh, probably around two millimolar. I, I don't remember exactly, but that range. So from those protein concentrations, of course, you can easily calculate the uh, average distance between proteins. And if the interprotein <coughs> distance matters, I would expect nonlinear um, increase uh, for the uh, measured anion concentration. But I don't remember if we really saw that kind of non-linearity. If I remember correctly, it was, I mean, linear uh, regression was just fine. So maybe uh, interprotein distance doesn't really affect much. Uh -uh. That's just my comment. Right, I, I, right. I really have to check the data once again. Um, but but if if I ask you, if you, if you if I ask you like this, well, where your ion excess values, they could they, you you would say that they correspond to which distance, going until how far. Uh, because in the, I remember that in the case of the of the Poisson-Boltzmann calculations, I remember when you gave your webinar, 
I think I think it was Walter that asked you in the case of the known of the Poisson Boltzmann calculation, how, how far have you have you gone? And you said till the end of the grid. I remember that. Yes, we used uh, quite and in the, a and in, in large the, uh, box for the um, nonlinear Poisson Boltzmann uh, right. calculation simply because we just followed the way people uh, do the same calculation for nuclear gas. Uh, probably uh, it was not um, uh, really uh, appropriate, but we just <laughs> took uh, uh, their setting for our uh, calculation. We are not uh, really <laughs> specialists <laughs> of computation. Uh, sure. uh, but, but anyway, maybe judging from what you presented today, the use of very large box was okay or even better. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Over there, or Hi. I don't know. Hi. Very nice talk. I uh, wanted to ask you if, now that you have found a good cutoff to work with at the uh, first what, part. Sorry, it, this makes a lot of echo. Oh, sorry. Then that you have a cutoff to work with yes. from the first part of your presentation, that you can find, do you think there is a way that you could couple this uh, percentage of protonation of the titratable groups and also the free energy calculations or maybe some entropy that you could lose when the the ions are organized near the protein or just you have less ions bound do you think there's a or a theoretical way or using constant pH to do that hmm the entropy contribution of the ions going away in a yes. sense. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know I would, I, how I, I would try to actually compute that. Uh, but I, but that's that's a, a, an interesting direction. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would have to think about I, I it. Don't know with you I don't know. I, I would have. I, I never thought about that, but that's that's a nice a nice question. And usually, I'm quite slow. I need a lot of time to think about things. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think there is one last question from the audience, Michael Lund. If he's still uh, connected, yes. Yes. Uh, hi, Antonio. This is this is Michael. Um, so very nice talk, and uh, this was uh, many of the, the things you're mentioning is something that we are we are battling with as well here. Um, so I I have I actually have a lot of questions, but I, I think I should uh, confine them a little bit. Um, I don't know if you agree with me, but um, um, I, I think many of the, the problems you're mentioning uh, that they come from the fact that you have a closed system. Is that right? That, that the, the the number of ions they're constant. Uh, they're not allowed to to come and go. I mean, I, I think that a lot of this could be solved by having a grand canonical uh, scheme for the salt, like like we have constant. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be the, the the right way to do it. Right, to use a grand canonical would be the right way to do this. Yeah, of, of having a number of fixed ions. In our case, we have a number of fixed ions. But that's we know that that's an approximation, right? We should yeah no. an open system, yeah. Right, because I think that the the, the, the issue with the with the with the ion excess is that uh, if you have something that binds to the protein, then you're going to have less at the edge of the box. So 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 that and you solve all these problems using the grand canonical scheme, and the same way with the when you add ions, you you can also let the grand canonical scheme take care of. I mean, the, the problem you described as, as to how many counter ions and so on, that will also be fixed by the grand canonical scheme. Um, so so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I, I hear on, uh, I'm giving a talk uh, on, on, on Thursday and I, I think that some of these problems, uh, they, they become even more complicated. I think when you go to, uh, when, when the proteins start to interact and, and the cells that you talked about, when they get closer, uh, we can see, at least if you use grand canonical uh, salt, that the amount of salt that you have in these systems, it actually varies. It, it depends quite a lot on the protein charge distribution. So it, it becomes quite complicated and, and difficult to predict uh, just by, I, I think 
the methodology you described in, in dilute solutions that would probably work quite fine. In, in, but, but when you start to concentrate, it, it's, uh, it's very sensitive to the actual charge distribution. If you have a, something that's very uneven, you have, a, you have a different ionic strength, you could say, in the system, uh, even though the net charge might be the same. Um, yeah, so, so uh, but, but then wouldn't it be possible in your scheme uh, to actually have grand canonical salt? Because it seems like you, you take out the protein structure, you strip away the water, couldn't you just make a grand canonical uh, scheme with with the with the with the ions and then well, put them back the into problem? the? I, I I use Gromax, and they have always been a bit hostile to anything that is not MD. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe I yeah. don't know. Um, yeah. At the point they had. I don't remember this. This was a lot a lo long time ago. At some point, they had a part in the code for Monte Carlo that I used that was used for something else, uh, but then they right. actually removed it. I, I would love to do this with with Grand Canonical. That's for sure. I, I think right. I use Grand Canonical for any for everything except the protein. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Well. We Okay, right. But John Codera was here at the protein electrostatics meeting some, some years ago, and, and they are doing a grand canonical in, in open yep. MM, right? So it, it's possible to do it in, in that framework. Yep. Uh, I, I was thinking more continuum electrostatics, so, so that would more be like on your, your side of things and then just put it back into Gromax. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, right. I, I would like to, to do this with the grand canonical. Yeah, that would be really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Then uh, I think we can discuss later, uh, uh, maybe during lunch, because uh, we are already quite late. Uh, so thank again the speaker of today.